Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wildweiler Weekly Wrap. As always, I am Wildweiler. I have far too many thoughts to talk about this week, and I don't exactly know where to start. So let's just dive right into it and see where we end up. Behind the scenes here, I do write scripts for each and every one of these vlogs, but they are more or less rough drafts. And as the episodes go on, I just kind of end up going off the path and into the weeds a bit. And that's going to happen really bad this time. So, buckle up. Our first topic this week is we need to go back in time to the year 2007. I, at the time, am both attending high school, technically, and college in a very more real way. Because I was a smart little guy, and I'm just old now. But, importantly, in 2007, I'm old enough to buy my first M-rated video game. So I bought Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, which had just come out and was on my local Walmart shelves. Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is maybe the only modern classic game that I played contemporaneously to its release, and I am glad I did because every time I encounter people talking about it on the internet, it's like I can actually participate in the conversation because I missed out on a lot of things like, say, Diablo or really just any game you can think of. Now, at the time, I still had to hide Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl under my bed because had my parents known that I had bought an M-rated game, things would have been bad for me. But I had it, and I played it, and I learned one very important thing. I would not recommend playing Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl in your basement at night in the dark. It is, uh, spooky. I won't go much into describing the game. You should absolutely watch the first 90 seconds or the entirety of the zero punctuation review of Stalker Clear Sky because it does sum up all the games perfectly. And I've included a link in the description. What all of this flashback to 2007 is building up to is, well, this week I was assaulted, if you will by a vicious wave of ennui. And not even the Saturday morning breakfast cereal comic that describes me when I feel ennui could cheer me up. And that is on your screen now. Which is to say, I was in trouble. So what I did was what any of us would do. And I scrolled through the thousands of games in my Steam library because I will buy any game pack if it supports a charity that I believe supports a cause that needs supporting. In this bizarre pile of interactables, I found a game called Tunguska the Visitation. Please note, the Tunguska event was a real thing and it really happened, and I read the Wikipedia page, and it's very interesting, and you should look it up too. Tunguska the Visitation appears to be one of those one-person developed games. It's a third-person fan remake, or possibly, like, homage to Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. I... I'm not sure the creator would call it those things. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. I will say it heavily copies many of the gameplay mechanics, story elements, and general everything that Stalker has. And it really, really dances carefully on the plagiarism versus borrowing line. You know, the, the line that, you know, good authors borrow, great authors steal. It, it steals in a way that doesn't feel fair if that makes sense. Very little of that matters because it's not great. I say that having been fully pulled into Tunguska the Visitation for 12 hours last week. I spent a lot of my free time playing this game. And the first issue I have with it is that it is simply poorly written. The quest tracker has no idea what it's doing. A lot of the quests rely on backtracking in that you don't know who you're supposed to talk to next. So you just go to all the safe zones in the entire map and talk to everybody until one of them has the magic dialogue option that spawns the next NPC you need to talk to. And that happens 
way more than once. So it's not great in that regard. There's a lot of you must do things in a very specific order. And if you do not do them in that order, well, bad luck you. There's also just wrong writing in the game. Example, at one point, I was told to find some gas masks. And my character finds them and they're tampered with. So he makes the mental note that I should not carry these with me or else I might grab them by mistake when I need a gas mask. And as the player, I'm like, got it, dropping the gas mask because that's you telling me there's maybe a thing coming up in the game where there'll be poison gas and I'll be tempted to open my inventory and put on a gas mask. And if I have these tampered ones in there, I won't be able to distinguish between the two. Well, I got stuck on this quest and I talked to everybody on the map and I did everything. So I go over to my old friends, the internet, where I find that the developer has written in a Steam forum post that you have to show the gas masks to somebody. And it's like, then why put in the bit about maybe I should drop it? So I kind of stopped playing the game at that point because I don't know if I can even go back and find it. Loot does disappear in this game. So I, you know, I don't know. And I realized that the game is definitely not respecting my time, whether this is on purpose or through negligence, but that was that. And this is where I'm going to say I get disappointed in myself. Because before that, we see that this game, Tunguska the Visitation, has a sexism problem. And a lot of the dialogue is explicitly weird in its treatment of women. Very much in the, like, ladies aren't hard enough to live in the death zone that both Tunguska the Visitation and Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl takes place in. But also... Just, like, weird commentary about how, I guess, evil events and eldritch horrors affect a woman's uterus. And I just... It was weird. It was frankly weird. It was a weird thing to run across. And then... I don't know. You're, you're seeing examples of this dialogue on the screen right now. So I will just let the words on the screen do the talking for me. Because, like I said, it is weird anyways so i realized tunguska the visitation is bad and sexist and a reductionist version of stalker shadow of chernobyl and then i realized i've never actually played stalker clear sky so i booted that up and now i'm playing stalker clear sky and i love it because frankly i love the stalker games i will talk more about the stalker series at some point, uh, probably after I go through and beat all the ones I haven't beaten, because I think they're really interesting and they hold a very special place in my heart that I think I want to talk about. So I'm going to close this topic as I customarily do by reviewing something. And that thing is going to be Tunguska the Visitation. While it somehow manages to capture the compelling nature of the Stalker games and even add meaningful energy, rest, and time system mechanics, it does so in a ham-fisted and clumsy way that only serves to add more chores to the game. So I believe at a game design standpoint, the developer was additive. They really reduced down the story and made it not great, and then added some commentary about women that are absolutely garbage. So as a result, Tunguska the Visitation gets a 3 out of 10. Avoid this game. It's not fun, even if the person is like, hey, here are some features that would make Stalker better, which is very true. This game is not Stalker. So rather than boosting Stalker, it is just bad. Longtime viewers will know that I have a soft spot for Guy Ritchie films. And so a group of friends and I watched the latest Guy Ritchie film, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. And what I mean by latest is that seems to be this year's Guy Ritchie film. He made two last year and one in 2022, which means he's cranking out movies like crazy right now. Like most Guy Ritchie films, The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare has an excellent score. It's shot beautifully. There's a lot of stylistic things going on that I love. It feels in so many ways like a World War II version of one of his previous films, Operation Fortune, Ruse de Guerre. But having slept on this idea, this idea that I have, it's more like a World War II version of his The Man from Uncle movie. These two movies have a lot of sort of 
little similarities with them. I will say the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare is a lot more violent. There's a lot more post-John Wick action movie in its DNA. Sadly, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare isn't going to win any awards. It doesn't particularly add anything to the action movie genre. It is truly just Guy Ritchie putting his twist onto a World War II story, which is fun and great and in my opinion, better than Quentin Tarantino's twist on a World War II story. While it doesn't introduce anything new, while it doesn't take a lot of thought, it's still a great, fun movie to watch. And because of that, I give The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare a 7 out of 10. Okay, I need a third topic this week, and after talking for like eight minutes about Stalker's Shadow of Chernobyl, we should probably, I don't know, talk about the year it came out, 2007. Because why not? So let's go through all the events that happened in 2007 that I lifted straight from its Wikipedia page. Number one, January 9th, Steve Jobs announces the first iPhone. Which is fine. It's fine. But Microsoft has a ace up their sleeve, if you will. They're upset that Apple's getting all this iPhone attention, so they come to the table with something truly shocking. Something that will literally shock everybody. And what I mean by that is Microsoft announces Windows Vista. And everybody is just basically shocked into a computer coma until they get rid of that thing years later with Windows 7. In February, the IPCC insists for the fourth time that climate change is caused by man. And we all proceed to ignore them, probably due to a whole bunch of reasons, but I would like to think it's because Tumblr came out the same month and we were all, you know, penning fan fiction. In June of that year, Bob Barker retires from The Price is Right, ending an era, but also sending a wave of relief to every non-neutered cat and dog in the country. A whole bunch of other stuff happens. There's a lot of sad things like multiple plane crashes, a surge in Iraq, a typhoon that kills a whole bunch of people. But in October, Valve releases the Orange Box, which is something that to this very day I have no idea what it is, other than a lot of people that I knew were talking about it at the time. And then we'll jump all the way to December, where Queen Elizabeth II, herself, Her Majesty, becomes the oldest reigning British monarch. I do not mean the longest reigning. I don't know when that happens, but I do mean oldest. At 81 years old and so many days, she has now outlived Queen Victoria. So she is the oldest reigning British monarch. It's a feather that she adds to her absolute bird of a hat at this point. Finally, Al Gore won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work in climate change awareness and some other stuff. I think the U UN also won the Peace Prize. Like it's a, it's a Peace Prize to highlight sort of climate activism. And I think it does pair very well with the IPCC's report on climate change. Uh, the problem is, is this in particular ruins my life because at the time I grew up in a very politically conservative household and that means Rush Limbaugh just complained about this for three hours a day because that year he got a whole bunch of his fans to nominate him for the Nobel Peace Prize. So for literally years afterwards, he complains that Al Gore has his Nobel Peace Prize, which isn't how Nobel Peace Prizes work. That was 2007. So you should think about your own 2007 and I don't know, leave it in the comments or something because that does it for this week. On YouTube, we have the final episode of my Warhammer 40k Space Marine Let's Play, which means I don't really have to say Warhammer 40k Space Marine again. So that'll be fun. You should watch it. It was a tough episode to film and even tougher to edit down because, oh boy, do I get spicy. As always, thank you for watching and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.